I'm going to keep letting people in as they join us, but um, I am going to go ahead and get us started so I can be respectful of everyone's time and do my intro. Um, first of all, I, she, her face is not on the screen. I don't know where she went, but um, my friend, our friend um, Natasha from Trinidad is here. I'm so excited because she's so great. And um, it's so wonderful to see all of you guys. So um, these are classes for the curious musician. And what we decided to do, the thing was, you guys know COVID sucks, right? And um, we noticed that a lot of our adult amateurs were losing their mojo. They were just, all the rehearsals are canceled, the chair music is canceled, the concerts are postponed. And, um, and I started hearing more and more, well, I haven't really been touching my violin. Yeah, I'm just not really feeling the, the energy for it. We were like, we've got to do something to, um, you know, kind of wake that back up. And so that's why we're doing classes for the Curious Musician. It is an eight week series. This is the second one. And the first one went really, really, really well. I am recording them. I will put them on YouTube, on the Huffmaker Violin YouTube channel. Um, this last one took me a week to get on there. So be patient with you don't see it in the next two or three days because I got to edit it and blah, blah, blah. Um, so a little housekeeping. I tell people to um, remember that I'm a lovely person, very talented and gifted, but not when it comes to technology. So if I'm clumsy, if I screw some stuff up, forgive me and just have a little patience for me. Um, I mean, well, <laughs> so um, of course, and this, the, of course, there's no charge for these things. This is our gift to you. Um, we say when you speak of Huffmaker Violin, speak kindly. That's all we ask. <laughs> if you need to rehear our bridge or want to buy a $40,000 violin, come see us. Um, mostly we're just glad you're here because we love music and making music more than anything. So that's all I could think of right now. Um, so let me introduce you our guest tonight. So this is cool. So, you know, as a bass player, I go and I sit in symphonies and play. And when I look ahead of me, I hear beautiful dulcet tones coming out of a cello section. And if I'm in the Johns Creek Symphony, there's always cello solos going on and it, they're stunningly beautiful. Well, <laughs> also if you go to the Johns Creek Symphony, there's a good chance that you could hear a beautiful cello song and look up and see stuffed animals tied to our guest tonight. Scroll, she's a whole hell of a lot of fun. <laughs> so, yes, I usually have a troll scroll, scroll troll, yeah. but right now I have the mask for this for the scroll mask. So that's that's, that's the seasonal uh, appendage. Sarah, Sorry to interrupt. Oh, Sarah, did a great job at proving that you can be a stunning musician and have a great sense of humor at the same time, and so and she's kind of famous for it. So I'm gonna like play around and try and put Sarah on big. This is Sarah Caps, and I am going to main monitor the chat. If you have questions during right now, you're all muted. Um, if you have questions, type them in the chat. I'll throw them at her. Um, if you have anything you wanna say, if you know the winning lottery numbers, you could do that in a personal chat to me and I'll take care of it. So, <laughs> all right, Karen, it's all, I mean, Sarah, it's all yours. <laughs> like hey. Karen, the problem. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to leave the camera this way if that works for people. I work on my iPad and it first of all it makes my eye contact better because if I turn it sideways then I'm looking over here and talking to you like this so it feels a little bit strange. So this helps me a little bit. Also you see more of the fingerboard. Um, if something comes up where you have to see my whole bow I have this way of um, flipping it but then it's hard to get all of it in. So I mostly teach this way. And um, when it's relevant, I'll come closer and I'll show you stuff like this and I'll back up so you can see all of this. Um, but um, anyway, so that's just why you're seeing me this way, um, which sometimes people ask about it. So I thought I would bring that up. Um, and uh, let's see. So we're talking about tone. And um, what I wanted to start off with was actually, a little, we're gonna have some interaction here. Um, so you can enter things into chat. I'm gonna start asking for like suggestions for um, word association. The first thing I wanna talk about is like, what is tone? What does it mean? What's, what are we looking for? What are we listening for with tone? It seems to be um, elusive, especially if you're struggling to get through a passage 
and just struggle like what's the Boeing or something like that. We often, uh, tone seems to be something extra we put on top. And um, so we're gonna talk through a lot of ways of tone and it's gonna become your habitual way of handling the instrument. And so that it just starts being part of your normal way of expression with your instrument. Um, so obviously this is a cello, but I will be translating things into upper and lower string mentality. Um, although uh, feel free to correct me if I say something that just feels like wrong for upper strings. Same thing with bass, like by all means chime in. Um, I'd love this to be, you know, a back and forth discussion up to a point, I guess. <laughs> um, so, um, so the first thing I wanted to do was to open up your imagination um, and to peer into your mind's ear, right? We talk about the mind's eye, but let's now go into our ears. And um, I wanna ask you if you know it when you hear it. Do you know tone? Does it, does it strike you? Um, something about it, I often talk about, uh, it, we have to have tooth on the sound to grab the listener's ear. Right, so if it's if we play too bland, uh, it, there's just nothing. It's like we need consonants on our words, and when we when stage actors are pronouncing their words, they've got to have they've got to have um, edges on the sounds of their words. And so, in a certain way, we need edge on our tone. Um, although we can all say that maybe too much attack is not what we're looking for. Um, some people have in mind that they want really smooth tone. So we're gonna deal with that. So um, let me, I'm gonna ask you some leading questions and then I will ask you to either put into chat or we can open up for discussion. Um, does tone, does it have a color? Does it have a flavor or maybe a texture? Right, so I want to start getting into your vocabulary and that we're going to play word association. Can you enter either into chat or raise your hands for words that strike you as things that belong to good tone? Something either you're striving for or reacting to when you hear it or something a teacher has told you to go for. Ah, good ones coming, meaty, warmth, velvety, the sound rings out, awesome, yes. Lush, oh, that's a good one. Color, warmth. Core sound, absolutely, absolutely. These are great. Pure, pure core tone, no screeching. <laughs> yes, singing, rich. These are, that's a really good start. Okay. Now, because the next question I'm gonna ask you is, and I don't wanna dwell on the negatives, but uh, something we were talking about Tai Chi a moment ago, and sometimes you have to think about what something isn't to define what it is. So for a moment, let's talk about some of the negative aspects or um, not good tone or things. And somebody mentioned one thing um, <laughs> already. Uh, so not screeching. Um, so what other kinds of, of bad tone could we imagine? You can put those in your chat. Let's see here. Tight, technically speaking, I think bow, ooh, bow distribution placement, thin, metallic, sharp, skating, these are coming. You guys got it, scratchy, <laughs> fingernails on a chalkboard, no feeling. Varying sound of notes, oh, that's really important. Mechanical, fabulous. Yeah, because that can be metallic or tight or like a lot of these kind of overlap, harsh. Mm -hmm. Scratchy came before, tinny, yeah. Okay, all right. Hey Sarah. Um, yes. Interrupt. Does everybody have your chat box open? Do you know how to do that? I'm assuming these days most people have done a thousand Zoom videos, but raise your hand if you haven't. And also in your upper right hand corner, if you haven't put it on speaker view, I suggest that so you can really see Sarah. Sorry, now I'm done. Mm -hmm. Somebody raised their hand about finding chat. All right, so if you go to the bottom of your screen, for me, I just hover. 
and all these things light up and you just click on the word that says chat. If you're on a on an iPad, it might be on the um, if you touch the screen, it might appear on the upper right hand corner. And it'll it'll be under more three dots and it says more. I got an OK. okay. Yes. It's, it's different for every device too. Yay. <laughs> Thank you for that because, um, yes, didn't want to leave people out in the dust. So we've got good tone, we've got bad tone, and we're going to, these are exactly where I was headed. Your guys' terms are exactly right. Um, is there somebody's uh, playing that you admire? Have you heard somebody either in real life or a recording where you say, like, anytime a Janine Jensen uh, video comes up, I'm like, I want to watch that, right? She just like I have my my people, um, so you may have those too. And so as you start listening to them, you could start um, seeing what they do as well as hearing what they do. Um, another thing, like I was thinking about this, like um, a, a person was asking me, like, what does a musician listen to? What do musicians listen to? Because like a lot of times I don't put CDs in my car and I'll drive for a long time without a disc in there or you know my, my device plugged in or whatever. And that's because in a certain way I have, I have three recordings of the Haydn D major concerto in my brain. And I just go, oh, I wanna think about uh, Rostropovich's tone. And I will like, I can just sort of play it in my brain because I've been like, salivating over it. I just, you know, love certain parts of his playing. So um, the tone, the core, the vibrance, these are all words that came up already. Those are things that, um, that strike us. Those are the things that carry. So if you're thinking about concerto playing, um, you have to cut through a lot of orchestral musicians behind you. And so that core then becomes the natural way of, of working towards the instrument. Um, so if you have your instruments handy, you are more than welcome to do this along with me because these are going to be, I'm going to, we're going to do tactile, kinetic, um, hands-on kinds of things. Um, and I'm not going to make anyone play. I'm not going to, um, you know, shame anyone or anything like that. Um, if you want to, if you want some, some like to play something and say like, why isn't this working? We, we can make time for that. I'm kind of assuming people don't, aren't totally <laughs> wanting to be put on the spot, but I could be wrong. It happened once when I was wrong. I don't remember it very well, but you know. Okay. So <laughs> All right, so the first thing we're going to do is um, uh, I'm reminded actually of when I was very young starting out teaching, I had an adult student come to me and she must have been older than me I, because I was only like 25 at most, right? So this, this lady came to me and she wanted to take cello lessons and I said, so what do you want to work on? And she said, well, I have two things I want to work on, my left hand and my right hand. And I thought like that always stuck with me. Like, yep, I get you lady, <laughs> me too. So, um, so the first thing I want to have you do is, um, we're just gonna take away from the instruments for a second. I want you to picture squishing clay between your fingers. Now, my mom was an artist. So actually as the musician in the family, I'm the black sheep but we took all the drawing, the pottery, all the dance classes. Um, music was an accident, a happy accident, but I did take pottery classes. So if you can imagine gripping clay and it squeezes out and it maybe squeezes between your fingers and clay is such a nice, rich, tactile thing, right? So we're gonna think of that. And as I'm doing that, I can really feel the muscles, especially in my left hand back here working because I feel like maybe it's less on the upper instruments but tone is work and so that's okay right strain is not a great thing um, and repetitive stress is not a great thing of course 
but um, but sometimes I see people and it just looks too easy and it doesn't have to be too easy. Like, we, let's work for it. So um, another mental image you can have is pulling taffy. All right, so imagine, imagine that thing between your fingers that's just being stretched. This could also be a rubber band. Um, okay, then you could also, if you're more into your kitchen, you could be stirring mashed potatoes. But that's a little bit of an easy stir. What about like cookie dough? You could be stirring cookie dough. You could be um, working with molasses, something that's getting sticky. Um, and then finally, for tactile things, if you could imagine what kind of fabric you might um, associate with good tone. Does anyone want to put in fabrics? I have a couple in mind, but if you want to put into chat some silk, yes, velvet. Suede, oh wait, I closed the chat too quickly. There were some good ones. Yeah, suede, I didn't think of that one, cat hair. <laughs> Duh, why didn't I think of that one? <laughs> also, um, what about fleece? Just like on a cold day, the feeling of like fleece, especially that, um, that fuzzy fleece, it's like, yeah. Mm. Of course I'm saying that and I'm like sweating my butt off today. So <laughs> it's a warm one. <laughs> so let's not think about fleece right now, but okay. So, <laughs> all right. Um, so while you have your instruments now, we're working on the tactile sense. Um, so fingertips, the fleshy part of the fingertips now, as you bring your hands to the string, you can pick any string. We're gonna, we're gonna go with one finger at a time. So we'll start with the first finger. And I want you to cover the string entirely and notice the fingerboard beneath your finger so that the string is it's sort of interrupting the flesh, but your flesh is covering all of, all of the string and then also the fingerboard underneath. Okay, now, the other thing about good tone is that you have to fully stop the string, right? If your finger kind of is, if it lands, you know, it's happened to all of us, like it lands a little bit funny or like your nail catches it or something like that, um, that tone will instantly be like a little bit sour or tinny or something, right? Especially if you catch the fingernail. Yeah, um, so of course we're aiming for the fleshiest part. Um, now, uh, okay, let's see. Let's see if we do, all right, let's do each finger now. Let's put second finger down and feel the fingerboard beneath, beneath the finger and the third finger. And just kind of rest it there. We're gonna be moving in a second, but I just kind of wanna get a feeling of like, the two dimensions or th the third dimension, I guess, of what you're, what you're landing on and the fourth finger. And I bet you, I, I bet you're all feeling that each finger has a little bit of a different feel. So um, just, you know, sometimes I can tell when I haven't practiced enough that my fingers aren't padded enough and it's a little bit sore, right? Especially if I'm going for tone. So these things, if, it, if at any point it hurts, please stop, right? <laughs> you just take the idea of it and don't continue. But um, I love, I'm seeing a few people write notes. I love that, right? So yeah, save ideas for later. If things aren't, aren't totally working for you, it could be something to work towards. Um, if it doesn't happen right away. This is all just, you know, it's a lifelong project, um, finding people tone. Um, okay, so that's the first tactile sense. Now, the idea of pressing the string down, I want the sense of, a, of smooshing. Now the smoosh is a dangerous thing to say because we don't wanna collapse our fingertips. Has anyone been, been bugged about playing on flat fingers come kind of like this versus keeping them a little bit stronger this way. Now we have sort of three versions, right? There's the super vertical, 
where your fingernails were, will touch uh, if, you're, if you're really up and down. And I think that upper strings have more of that. My pinky gets you every time. I feel your pain. <laughs> so, um, right, so the, I think even within an upper string um, metaphor here or thought process that I think we can still have the, the medium rounded and then the, the flat. So just, we will explore the flat because honestly, if you watch some of your favorite, sorry, I didn't, didn't mean to leave violas out. <laughs> I'm seeing the chat pop up while I'm speaking in case people don't understand why I changed the subject suddenly. Okay, so um, I've seen people that are amazing players, but they end up doing this and I'm like, hey, wait, is that allowed? Maybe. Maybe it is allowed. Yo-Yo does it. Yeah, yeah. Um, Saul Gabetta, she's kind of a flat fingerer. And that's because like, hey, if you're going for like a massive vibrato or like, a, you know, a special moment, throw the rules out the window, right? Now, what we're doing is we're providing a foundation so that more of this can be there more of the time. And then, you know, uh, do as I say, not as I do. Um, Yes. Now I will, let me pause for two seconds and tell you that um, a lot of this came about only a year ago. I broke my arm, I broke my left arm, just a little fracture at the top of the radial head. And they put me in a, um, a removable cast, thank God, uh, <laughs> because I did remove it from time to time. And I slept in a like a you know ace bandage sometimes, but um, being prevented from moving, I was still able to demonstrate just a little bit. And then when it was time to take the cast off, this rotation was really hard. I was pretty stiff. And then I had to go to physical therapy, and I still feel it. I still have to kind of you know get in there and get on it. But the whole recovery process was really, I'm so grateful for it. You know, I'm not glad I broke my arm, but the recovery process and learning from it was really helpful because it was an opportunity, right? Challenge equals opportunity. It was an opportunity for me to really think through my technique. Why do I do these things? Or what should I be doing if I can't, don't have a reason for why my finger is flat? then maybe there is no reason for my finger to be flat except that I'm being lazy or, you know, unattentive, right? So a lot of this is just getting your technique to where you want it to be. And, um, you know, what, what your teachers along the way have, have told you is important and shown you what's important. So, um, okay, so the smush. Now, as you are smushing, we're gonna do this finger by finger since you have your instruments up. Okay, so first finger first. And I'm basically, for me, I'm gonna stay in the shoulder region here, in the neck region rather, of my instrument. Um, if we have time, we might discuss what happens to tone as we get into the, the extreme regions of the instrument. But let's really just focus on like first and second and third, maybe fourth position. So um, there's the smush where you're putting the weight of the finger into the string. That's depressing the string that's holding it down and that's going to create clear tone when you can feel the fingerboard beneath your, your finger. Now on that, if you can imagine just the slowest beginnings of a vibrato, we're going to tug in each direction. Now you may want to go flatter for some of this. And you may experiment with going really on the tippy tops of your fingers, but this, I'm gonna be honest, this hurts me, right? So I don't spend a lot of time on the tippy tippy top. That's the, the tip of your bone, right? So I, I feel like you really could make an enemy out of your, your fingers that way if you're, if, you know, if you spend too much time, I don't know, and maybe this is a cello thing more than a violin viola thing. Um, so, so we're tugging. Now let's go to second finger. Are you pressing too hard? Well, ah, okay, let's, um, 
yes, when it hurts, somebody asked in the chat, am I pressing too hard when it hurts? I think is the, um, the idea here. And um, string height can be an issue. So help me remember to come back to that thought because uh, your strings are farther away from your fingerboard up here and they're closer to the fingerboard down here. So um, that can be at play. So let's, let's definitely put that in the, in the mental bank there. Okay, um, smooshing and dragging. Now we've done the first couple of fingers. Let's go to the third finger, get the string down, drag back and forth. Now I have a theory that when I say third finger, I really mean first three fingers. When I say fourth finger, my, my general concept is that all four are down. Of course, there are times when we can't do that, right? Double stops, for example. But um, just as a, as a general comment, I try to avoid leaving any one finger out, right? Um, first finger doesn't count and you have to do first finger alone, I guess, <laughs> but any finger beyond that, then I like to have the, the, the community behind them. This is especially true on fourth finger. If I need a good fourth finger vibrato, here's my secret. A good fourth finger vibrato is a good third finger vibrato that the fourth finger is riding, going along for the ride on. So, <laughs> Somebody liked that. Okay, <laughs> very good. So, okay, so we've smushed, we've tugged. Now we need to drag a little farther. So we'll go back to first finger. Now here's the, again, these are our initial um, vibrato exercises when we're introducing vibrato for the first time to people. So what I'm doing is I'm dragging that finger one direction and my hand's gonna follow behind and I'm gonna turn direction. If I'm going flatter, I'm gonna drag behind this way. And so just this sense that there's not just one way to put your finger down. And that can be done flat this way. It can also be done steep this way. I'm gonna give you a few minutes to just go through each finger. And you can go like, you can cover a lot of distance if you want. So when we're teaching vibrato, we go like a lot and then we start to narrow it down. And then eventually you plant, smoosh, right? And there's your vibrato. So we start with, kind of a, a, a gross level gesture, not gross like disgusting, but, but big, a big gesture. And then third finger, you can try that. So smooshing, tugging, smooshing, and then eventually staying in one location. Now, this is a pretty wild vibrato, right? I don't really vibrate like this, but there's the action. Um, it's a freedom for cello. There's a lot of cello and bass. Vibrato comes from a much bigger muscle set. From what I understand, violin vibrato is way much more up here. Would I, am I correct in <laughs> in uh, thinking that, like that it's kind of finger and wrist vibrato, right? So on cello and bass, um, we, yeah, we try to discourage just wrist, um, wrist action. So it's really coming from some much bigger thing going on there. Yeah, I feel for you guys, I do not know how to do a finger vibrato. It would be, that would be, I mean, I guess you learn it, but <laughs> is it easier up there? Karina? Yeah? Okay. Huh. I love playing upper strings. I taught string methods for many years, for about six years. So I did play violin and viola and bass at one point in my life. Um, I can teach teaching it more than I can, you don't wanna hear me play it. Talk about tone. Okay. <laughs> 
So, okay, now did we get all our fingers? Did we drag them all around? Um, yes. Now, the other thing that this leads to, this is the primary way that we warm up our vibrato and teach the muscles um, how, to, how to execute vibrato, but it also gives us a variety of vibratos. And here's a thing that's gonna come in handy. Put that in your toolbox now as ways to um, work with tone is that your vibrato is going to greatly enhance um, and be a part of good tone. So um, no matter what you do with your bow, if, if this isn't really supporting the idea of the sound, the velvet or the chocolate or the molasses or the mashed potatoes, uh, they, they both hands really have to work as a team at that point, um, a team with your ear and with your imagination. Uh, so that's, that's a good start with the left hand. Um, and right, we'll have wide vibratos and narrow vibratos and you know, wild vibratos even, fast, slow. Um, there's also a depth to vibrato. Um, so good, we'll move on now to, um, to our bows. So um, assuming you have uh, rosin on your bow and, uh, and it's working properly and tightened, but not too tight, uh, I often see people <laughs> right and then they have these big parallel lines here and it kind of makes me go oh, don't do that so um i'm sure anna has seen the casualties <laughs> of over tightening um but the other thing that over tightening does is that you have no give so um uh yeah you're gonna you want you want to imagine that the bow can hug the string, right? Um, too loose a bow, of course, you're not getting any, you need a little bit of tension, right? If you're pulling that taffy or pulling the rubber band, you need a little bit of that tautness. So we gotta find that middle ground. Now, um, some words that I think of when I'm trying to get a student to, um, to draw a bow that's gonna be useful. First off, yes, we can see my bow. So this is a 200 year old bow made by Thomas Dodd. I'm so super lucky. It was actually originally an open trough bow. So it did not originally have this mother of pearl here. It is ivory, sorry, um, but uh, it's old, so they didn't know better back then. Um, it did have an ivory button that cracked, so I had um, I had a an ebony one um, put on. I am actually going to get the frog replaced uh, because I can't really travel. That's right; it was pre ban. <laughs> I'm I'm forgiven, I suppose. Although I was honestly, when I saw this bow, I was like, "Hell no, I'm not buying that." And then I played it, and I was like, "Crud." I have to buy this bow, damn it. <laughs> it just, ha it was like that. Like I knew when I saw it. Um, so uh, anyway, um, what was I gonna say? Oh, I am planning on getting a new frog made for it. It's also just, it's so old. It's got like a bit of a chip in here. So it's, it's not um, ideal and it's a better fitting one would be helpful, I think to its, to the playability. Um, so yes, this is my, this is my first favorite child, um, aside from Buster, who is of course my first favorite. Um, he's, he's the cat that gets this famous on Facebook. Um, so, okay. So the, when drawing the bow, I often find that people, uh, tend to go too fast, right? <laughs> They just immediately go, go in. And then two things happen. First, you don't catch the string. And second, you run out of bow, right? So we get into, right? And you get choked. So many times, I gotta get this just a, here, bear with me. I'm gonna lower this stand 
just the littlest bit. The contact point. I do want to talk about contact point. Uh, so, really making sure that you don't fly out of the, the starting point. So you're gonna now ah, lower strings have to put weight into the into the frog, right? Upper strings, you kind of just want the weight of the bow itself. Is that maybe a fair way of putting it? Where, because when I play on a violin, I crush the sound immediately, right? I go, because it's just like, I'm so used to as a lower string player, I'm used to putting it the, that weight in. Violists are often needing to be encouraged, I think, to drop weight. And I wonder if that's because they are violists who were once violinists. Right. Also, you have thicker strings. The thicker the string, the slower, uh, the slower the response time. Here, let's read a couple comments here. Uh, okay, so the crunch at first. Um, sometimes, um, if you use more weight, you must use more bow speed. That's true, that's true. Okay, so the crunch at first, um, I would encourage a couple different words, um, but there are, there's a bow stroke that I use. It's a detache bow stroke. And you do, let's have everyone put your bows on your strings if you have your instrument out. And what I want you to do is grab the string without, without actually moving, right? So, if you think of it, I like to think of it as a pizzicato with the bow, right? When you pluck the string, you're pulling against it and the release is what's creating the sound. So, uh, so that is, you can, I think of it as pizzicato with the bow, that you start it like a pizzicato, right? And you get a ta or a da. I can make a ma or even a ha. You have variety. So these are all things that are part of your modes of expression, right? Um, Starker, Janusz Starker was big into um, syllables. What consonant are you starting on, if it's a consonant at all? Um, so certain words that I wanted to put out there for you guys were coax, draw, conjure, right? Sometimes attack. These are all just single notes here. Um, sometimes we need to fire it up and that's fine. That's the good, fast, quick bow speed with the pizzicato feel, the grabbing of the string first. And a good bow stroke is then the pizzicato that you keep riding, right? I'm gonna keep it and sustain it. Now, as, um, as the child of a preacher, I'm gonna tell you something. The word sensual always creeped me out. I cannot, I just don't like the word sensual, but, <laughs> but it, it, we are talking about the feeling of it, right? So we're gonna have to just, get over our creepies and you know or my whatever it's maybe just my thing but um but feel that string beneath you and so to coax or to conjure even you know they might have certain you know connotations but um but hey music goes there it does so sometimes we have to do things that are romantic sounding, right? So all kinds of things that, that, you know, any kind of approach would be appropriate to the music, depending on what the music needs us to do. And when we get there, it's all gonna come back to what does the music need to sound like? Um, so that's, I just gave away my closing points, but that's where we're going with this. Um, okay, so we have bow speed, slow bow, slower release when possible, when appropriate. 
Um, and too slow a bow, what happens when the bow is too slow with too much weight? So there's this combination like, like you're a chemist, you add weight and bow speed, right? Into your, into your thing. And what happens if you pour too much of both of those in? What happens to your tone? Crunchy, I think, yes, the crunch. Now, um, hey, sometimes there's use for that. Breaks, scratchy, yes, all of that. Um, even a froggy sound. Um, and of course, I love to you know, demonstrate my <coughs> ribbit. <coughs> Right, so those are below the and a cricket, so you can get some some fun techniques there. Okay, so um, so yes, scratchy tone, scratchy tone. Given this is one step beyond a good bow stroke. If you think of it that way, you can always come right back from the brink, and so actually finding your scratchy tone is part of the scientific process of knowing what's too much to handle for any given moment. Um, so it's not a bad thing if you make a scratch or a squeak. It's just part of noticing what you're looking for. Um, and so sometimes I'll be playing something very, you know. <laughs> just hit it a little too hard with just a little not enough bow speed it will tell me um so there's that there's the weight the the speed and then there's the contact point so i'm sure you've been bugged i was a very shy player when i was young i didn't want to make any sound because if you can hear me then you might know that i'm wrong right it's very dangerous to play out loud. So the, the more confident you can get, the more, I, I was shy, I know. Somebody said, what? <laughs> I don't know, I guess I grew out of it or something. So um, yes, we, uh, yes, it took, I was, yes, it, it takes us a long time, but it's okay. We're there for you. Um, so, okay, your contact point. Um, it's, I think we'll all agree that it's much easier to be scratchy when you're close to the bridge. Is that something people have, have felt? And so that's the other thing. It sounds nicer when we're further away, right? Nice, it's pretty, it's, you know. It's, it's, it's like less um, argumentative, right? It's like, um, it's like having no opinions, right? It's I think it's healthy to have an opinion as long as you don't go screaming it in someone's face. So, so right, of course, sometimes we want the, the you know, um, Ponticello sound, but um, they always tell me to be closer to the bridge for more sound. Yes, and we have to sort of be brave about it. Um, what's interesting is the higher notes. So like if I'm playing way up, up in the, in the for this is a treble register, um, we have to go closer to the bridge. You'll just get no, no sound out. So, I'm right there on the bridge. So maybe what you could do right now actually is explore, pick a high note that you like to play pick something up here in the fingerboard region and just see how with a good vibrato see if you can get really on the bridge almost right up to it and you can start away from the bridge and then ease your way in let's do legatos because changing the um changing the bow is is another thing we should talk about right bow just so long tones um for now and then we'll talk about what has to happen with your bow grip when we change bows right because like that's not gonna really tell you much about your tone but if you can just lean on one note and just make friends with it 
um, way up somewhere like that. found a crunch in there. Uh, how's that going? Do people have things to share with that experience with a long tone and a high note and close to the bridge? The other thing that happens up there is that you get more undertones and overtones, right? So this vibrational sphere that's happening is it's um, I don't know what's happening to physics, but it's a, it's physics. So, <laughs> but no warmth. Okay. Um, how's your vibrato? Do you feel like the vibrato? It, so there's one, one comment in the chat that you're not quite getting, um, warmth of your sound. Does anyone want to share their experience? I didn't see who that was. It's Karen, K-A-R-I-N, not because we have two Karens. Ah, uh, she's welcome to join the convo if she likes. <laughs> yes, um, what if your vibrato, Karen, were um, a higher tone, harder to vibrate? Okay, find one, um, let's find one that you can do a good vibrato on. Maybe it's gonna be a bit lower. Um, so pick a note that you, a high note that you feel comfortable for vibrating on and see if you can get, maybe a little wider vibrato. I don't know what instrument you're playing, Karen, but, um, yeah, you could, you could go for a, it just an easier. Yeah. Okay. So like, um, not too narrow vibrato. Um, no, it's not cello specific, but I, I, I'm more of an expert on cello to, you know, to be fair. Um, uh, okay, so, oh, I'm sorry, Marie has a cello specific question, but I do have a broad, haha, okay. Um, Cello is new, so some position as we shift up, how do we do vibrato and get a good tone as we get our thumb off the neck? Okay, so are you, you mean up heat, like when your thumb is resting, maybe? Yes, okay. Um, excellent question. So uh, basically, we like to have the thumb, you know, on the string, right? But what if it were just sort of nearby? Because again, if I'm working on a good vibrato, lots of stuff can go out the window. And I like, I might do like either one and two or just two and three, because that way you have some leverage, right? And then you can get a pretty good vibrato. Now, if, I, if I'm gonna be needing that thumb, something's gonna to have to be sacrificed, right? So I may then not have all of this, this wiggle room, literally. Um, so, okay, but uh, we were on a violin. I'm sorry, I'm jumping around here. Um, uh, there was a violin question of, okay, when playing very upper positions on the violin, lower strings, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you almost have no option but play closer to the bridge, otherwise you end up playing the neighbor strings. Yes, that also happens, right? So you're way up here, you're depressing the string and it's actually lower than the other strings. And that's not violin specific, that's definitely, um, definitely a, a common problem. Um, and so uh, was there, did the violinist uh, with, the, with the tone question get answered enough? ish Sarah I don't know if this was the mm -hmm. one you're talking about but Denise Croy had asked um on staying in the zone bow wise and I want to uh, because my students always have this problem also 
Yes. Okay. So um, there are a couple tricks you can do. Um, I'm sure people have like, I've never seen a convincing one for cello, but like the, the like the, there are these things that you put in the F holes and they keep you in line. And that entire, I don't know. I don't know if they work or not. Um, there's another trick that I learned, which is to have your bow, basically draw your bow, use a mirror to do this. Draw your bow so that you know it's straight. Then hold the, t okay, hold on. I'm gonna do it this way. Let us see this, there we go. So you're gonna draw the bow and see how the camera's off too. Okay. Now, what I'm doing is I'm gonna pretend that I'm playing at the frog and then I'm gonna train my arm how to feel this path that it has to travel. And it's a different path for every string. So on the, on a higher string, well, for cello and bass on the higher string, it's a more extreme thing you have to do to get farther away, right? Um, from your, from the whole thing there, right? You have to go way out here. It's easier on, on the, these strings for us, right? And so I might do it here. And then you have on, if you're on the G string on a, you know, on a G or C string on an upper string, you have more, um, more stuff to do. Um, We use regular drawing strings for violin, but maybe those extra thick. Oh, uh, yeah, because like we need to have something that doesn't fall in, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, now, there's no substitute. Do I have tips for the upper positions, lower strings? Mm, oh, great word, stale. Yeah, can you remind me to answer that in a second? Um, the other thing about staying in the zone before I leave that, um, uh, before I leave that idea, staying in the zone is again, you, when you're listening for it, you won't be able to tolerate the sound when it's not what you want. So the clearer an idea of, of a formed idea in your mind's ear of what you're trying to accomplish with your tone. When that starts coming, and I have more ideas on this that we're gonna get to, once you build that idea of what you want the music to sound like, your body will start to do it on its own, right? So some of this is habits, right? We have habits of like, you know, bowing this way or something. So we do have to deal with those things. But uh, you, music is immediate feedback. Playing the instrument is the immediate feedback. So if, it's, if that tone starts to fade, you just go right in for it. Now, what, when this is hard is when you're struggling with what your fingers or your rhythms or your bowings are. So if you know your bowings cold, if you know the fingering or where the shifts are, if you've, if you've handled business first, okay then handling the sound of the music, I think is going to start coming more naturally. That's a lot to ask. I get it. It took, it, it takes years. Um, so it's always just something you can always kind of be striving for. Um, and yeah, good tone is just, it's a, it's a journey rather than a destination. right? Um, and it, there's so many moving parts. So let me answer that other question that came up, which was higher strings on um, higher positions on lower strings. I, I would say this doesn't have to be cello centric, right? This can be all of us. Um, and you know, there's something about when a composer asks specifically for us to play, you know, these, these crazy, like I, I always think of like violinists doing the, the G string things, right? Like, and they have to do this. And, and 
but there's um there's actually something fuzzy about the sound that that is gamey on purpose maybe right it's a little more um raw or uh if they wanted it to be as clear and toneful as as possible they wouldn't tell you to play it up a low string so in a certain sense you want to embrace Fuzzy is not a word we embrace, right? When it's too fuzzy, that's that means um, diffuse and not focused and not with tone. Um, but uh, but there might be a certain character that they're looking for. Velcro, <laughs> the the fuzzy side of the Velcro. Um, <laughs> okay, so when you're up there, though, um, we do. This is where um, making sure that the the string is fully stopped. Right, so this might, this comes, there's a lot of left hand strength that comes with the upper positions, lower strings. Um, and I mean that on, on violin and viola too, um, but you know, high notes on a thick string, put it that way. So because the str string is so thick, um, I'm definitely gonna bolster my vibrato fingers where possible, right? I also use a lot of um, what I call left hand articulation. So you can almost hear the finger go down, right? And you can hear it being picked up. Now, too much of that and then we get weird, like weird habits that we're all probably trying to not have or trying to get rid of, you know, the, the fingery playing, right? It's too much of that, yes, I always have to give a caveat. Um, but then a, denser vibrato, right? So I might not, you know, certain types of vibrato lighten your hand. So this would be kind of a heavy vibrato. Um, and then all the much slower bow. So, right, you just have to kind of... Versus... Right, I, I don't know if you can hear that over Zoom, but uh, what I notice actually is when my students play with good tone, it totally catches on the microphone. As soon as they lose tone, it's like, I can't even hear you. The mic, I wish they could hear what I could hear through the microphone because that's your feedback, right? So <laughs> um, maybe a bad microphone is actually quite, uh, quite um, uh, informative. Do you know that us bass players re-gigging about your strings being thick. <laughs> I think that was a joke. <laughs> yes, thick strings, like a bass string, you know, it's, um, I was just talking to Mo Winograd today. He's a bass player in town and um, he was, so he's a bass player, but he had one of the school cellos in his hands. And he was like, Sarah, this is so easy. Blah, 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 blah. And he was like, this is just too, too much fun because it speaks with no effort, right? So um, if you want your instrument to sound, to feel easy, play the next bigger instrument and then come back to your own instrument and you'll be like, oh, this, yeah, it's much, much easier. Um, so, okay, contact point. Now we have three ideas. There's weight, weight distribution. So um, your all the things that they tell you about about having um, your arm pronate as you draw. Um, they it's for a reason. Okay, so if we picture that this is an extension of our arm, we have to get the weight all the way out, right? We have to get that weight far out, and. Um, little known secret, cello bows are a little bit shorter than violin and viola bows, uh, and bass bows are even shorter. Bass bows are a blast to play with, right? Because they're just there, right? You just play, but, um, um, and sorry, no, <laughs> no offense, but you guys have to, uh, you know, get farther out the bow with the longer, with the longer stick, so. Not that it's easy. I think other things are hard about bass, like carrying it around and buying a car that's big enough. I don't envy them for that. <laughs> and I had to, I lived in New York, I had to take this thing on the subway and I would see guys with basses get on the subway and I would just be like, you poor thing. Like I would not have to want to carry, you know, 
put it over the turnstiles and get through the gates and pay for your fare and people touching it and getting, you know, getting in your way. So we have it easier. True, but I feel like the violin, we have gravity on our side. Yes, to help with the weight. Um, I struggle with cello keeping the weight distribution from even, for, yes, okay. So weight distribution um, and keep elaborating on pronation. Exactly, so weight distribution and pronation go together. So let's see if I can find a good camera angle for y'all. Okay, so what we're looking at, so pronate, pronate is this way, supinate is this way, like supine. So pronate, um, we, and the, the goal is that if we're in a neutral position at the frog, by the time we get farther out, we have to get a little bit of weight to go farther down the stick, right? And so by the time we get out here, it's very far away from all the strongest parts of our body. And so, and, and the heft, the natural weight of the frog is your friend. So right about midpoint, maybe just past the midpoint, I have to change my game plan. I can make it all the way to half the, half the bow without really worrying about my, bow, my weight distribution. Now, out here, my um, upper fingers barely have much to do. They're kind of keeping things in check. They're keeping the bow from falling on the floor, but it's really the forefinger and this tugging action. So one thing I like to do with my students is I will tug this way while they are pulling I'll tug against their bow stroke, right? So if they're doing an up bow, I'll push against. This is something you could do actually for yourselves. If you have your bow on the string, let's do, yeah, let's do a down bow and tug against. So I'm pulling this way, but I'm gonna draw a down bow. And so this gives you a sense of, of really, um, there's your tacky pull, right? There's your tug on the, the rubber band. Um, so then the next thing is um, with your weight distribution, your pronation, um, then there's bow apportionment or bow distribution. And that's your best friend. Okay, so um, again, so many times we're worried about making sure I knew that it was an F sharp and not an F natural or what scale is this? Or why are there so many sharps in this measure? Meaning that I'm much more concerned with my left hand and getting the notes right, that we forget that none of that makes any sound without this. So this is highly responsible for what the listener is hearing. And so um, I see this time and again, the, um, the, the, the bow distribution gets ignored. Um, and so just little things like, so if I have a ta, ti, ti, ta, and I see, it's amazing how, how far we have to go to get you know, this is just fractions, right? If I have a note that's twice as long, I'm likely to use twice as much bow and then small bows for small notes and things like that. So I, I'm constantly looking for ways to get people to understand fractions. I'm not a math teacher, but, but fractions are our friends. Um, so bow apportionment, um, Using the tip of the bow, I, I forget who it was. It was somebody like Perlman or um, Zuckerman maybe that talked about, you know, that they would always make a snarky remark like, you paid for the whole bow, but you're only using half, right? So 
using especially the magic zone, those last four inches. It's, um, it's just so much happens right up in there. So I invite you to just enjoy those last four inches. We have things like uh, when I do... happens right up in there. You can really have some special things happening. Lots of good stuff happens down here. It's my favorite place to play. Let me tell you, I love it down here. Violinists don't, right? Uh, the, um, yeah, violinists like to play at the tip. That because that because of gravity, right? But um, yeah, they freak out when you tell a violinist or violist to play the frog. They're like, why? <laughs> and you tell, you tell uh, just, and so I, you'll see it sometimes in orchestral bowings where if the, if the cellos have to do, cellos and basses have to do what the first violins are doing, there's sometimes there's war, right? There's just sometimes like, you know, I don't want to do um, like, out here, right? Makes much more sense for a lower string to be down here. So picking the right part of the bow, um, especially when you don't have a violinist telling you where to be <laughs> or a different instrument telling you where to be, um, be in the right part of the bow. It makes so much difference. Um, so how's that making, is that making sense so far? Benjamin Zander tells me, tells the young cellist his mom paid for the whole bow. <laughs> That's right, you get to guilt trip them sometimes, right? Just to get down there. Um, and I see it time and again, just, you know, we all have our different um, quirks, but I have a student that just stops right there. Just, she just stops there. So, um, and that, I can tell you another anecdote about um, a few years ago, I got a broke bow. Um, lovely birthday present for my husband and um, the Baroque book. So I love Baroque music, right? It's like, it just makes you feel good playing, you know, Bach cantatas and things like that. Um, Brandenburg concertos, they just feel good. And part of the joy of Baroque bow is that it has a very light frog. And so everything just feels, again, it's like playing on a bass bow. Everything feels like the middle, right? You're not really thinking pronating isn't as much of an issue, sustaining isn't an issue because the bow's shorter, you're only gonna get so far. Um, and choking up. So somebody just mentioned fiddle players choking up. There are a lot of, um, not a lot, but there you'll find modern players that choke up because actually you get more power at the tip, right? You're closer to it. Um, you have less attack, so you won't get that pizzicato start, the, the strong um, attack there. But, um, you know, it, some people enjoy that. And um, I've done certain exercises with students where I've had them, you know, hold it here now, play. <laughs> Can you play it? If you can do that, then you can certainly. Right, you can certainly do it with a whole bow. So we end up wasting a lot. Um, bow waste, this wasn't something I had on my list, but string crossings and bow wasting. I'm gonna shake my finger. You're all wasting your bows when you cross your strings. That's all I'm going to say about it. So be like, get into the nitty gritties. And when you cross a string outward, you end up losing this much of your bow each time, but usually more, because usually what I see is this, because that, does that make sense? Versus go straight, straight to the next string. A different feel, but the same problem. Suddenly it's a frog, right? What happened to all that, all that middle of the bow? So you can, you can really get into those, that. Um, that's a big one. I 
I'm glad I remembered that before we left today. Um, how are we doing so far? Oh, more chats, fiddle players. I saw someone, I saw somewhere to think left and right instead of up and down. Does that make any sense? It does. And then, um, so left, right versus up, down bows. And another one I really like is push and pull. So a down bow is pull. And that, that goes in with like our vocabulary of coax and draw, right? Pull. And that's very French. You want to pull the sound out of the instrument, right? So we pull and then push, right? So it does feel like you're pushing this way um, when you're going up bow. I love those terms. Um, they're much more descriptive of what's what the body really has to do. Um, so yeah, good good thoughts there. So I'm gonna hit a couple more ideas and then plenty, probably plenty of time because my last ideas are about equipment, right? We touched on this a little bit. Um, for good tone, you wanna make sure that you have the best strings you can get your hands on. And that's a different brand, it's a, such a personal choice. A lot of people want string recommendations. Um, and there are certainly ones that are in the higher categories and certainly ones that I do not recommend. I don't even know the names of the ones I don't recommend. I just know you don't want them. <laughs> and they will sound tinny no matter what, right? No matter how much vibrato and slow bow you put on there. Rosins is another like, eh, rosin? I'm a little less picky, but I have a rosin. I have my favorite rosin. Um, it's called Chalisto. Um, so I don't know that it's gonna work for, for upper strings, but, um, and then base rosins are completely different than the, than the hard rosins. Um, but um, good string quality, um, a good setup, right? Making sure your, cello, your instrument rather is healthy and has good string height making sure that your fingerboard is properly planed. Um, and I happen to know somebody that does work on instruments. Who was that? That was somebody around here. Oh yeah. <laughs> is Anna laughing? Okay. Um, no, this was actually an opportunity to plug Huthmaker Violins because you know she does excellent work. She cares about her customer. Plug and that, that <laughs> <laughs> that's right. She cares. And that's, that is like more than its weight in gold is somebody who cares about her customers. So really, um, but um, getting a bow rehair, making sure you have enough hair on your bow. Um, and then of course your instrument, you know, it, it's, it's a struggle. Like, you know, just nobody can afford what we really should be playing on, but that's, you know, that's kind of the reality of it. Um, but having something in good working order is, is absolutely necessary. It's, um, you wouldn't go on a long car trip with bald tires. So, um, you know, it's, it, and it increases your joy and your pleasure in music making. Um, always to have just things operating, even things, you know, like your pegs fitting right. And, um, you know, strings that haven't gone false. So getting fresh strings that, you know, changing your strings more often than, than you know, I get away with it, like, right? You can get away with it for a while, but there's that fresh string feel. It's very, you know, it's like a new haircut, you know, it just makes you, it makes things, just better. So all of that, taking care of things, um, always, you know, always consider that. Um, and then, and then my last, my last prepared thought that I had for today was that you always want to remember the music. The reason why you want good tone is that there's something in the music that you're trying to say. So, um, and I'm reminded of one student who's working on the sites concerto and he's he's doing great right he's he's really managing getting around the instrument once you get to sites concerto that's suzuki four you've gone through kind of the like you're about to take off once you get to suzuki four if you're developing a player 
things get a lot more interesting at that point. Um, so he's going. <laughs> Okay, now a lot of you may have learned this piece. And I said, I used his name and I said, hey, don't forget the music. What about the direction? What about the shape of these notes? What about the notes that need to be connected to each other? Do these notes belong together? And with encouragement, no practicing involved, but just with encouragement to think about how this should sound. <laughs> He was able to play music only when asked to, not with, he did not have to practice it. It just came out. Now he has to be reminded because it's not a habit yet, right? He's still thinking two, four, one, how am I gonna get to the string crossing? Uh, it's a duffo. We have a lot to work through, we all do. Um, but if you remember that that's what we're doing, the sound is there. It's for you, right? It's already there. So all you have to do is just keep asking yourself, what does the composer want this to sound like? Um, what can I do to bring this alive? Oftentimes there's just a simple legato here or string crossing there that can be tidied up and can turn everything around and really suddenly you're playing music, musically, not your instrument technically, right? The, the jump from technique to music can be just effortless, right? And then that's the effort, right? Ah, oh, but I really wanted to. Oh, I scratched too much there, I was working too hard, right? Sometimes the work is worth it, sometimes you got to back off. So that was a good thing for me to discover because I wanted to play some scratchy things for you by accident. Um, <laughs> so. Now, some of the things that's hard about this piece, just in particular, is that we play their long down bows and then you've got to get a quick up bow. Well, how do you deal with tone when, wait, Puppy time. Hi, puppy. Thank you, Greg. <laughs> so how do you deal with tone when you have an uneven distribution, right? We all know, oh, okay, quick up bow, you have to be lighter and faster because you don't want. Right, you don't want things to stick out and be lumpy. So don't be lumpy, right? Okay. Just don't be lumpy if you don't want it to be, or maybe you want it to be lumpy. So. Maybe sometimes it should be bumpy or lumpy, right? So that's mostly just to encourage you to, to seek, seek the truth, right? And, and let it happen. Um, don't get stressed out. It's too much that's hard and stressful in life. So you have the tools, you have a toolbox. So those are, that's kind of my, the stuff on my to-do list with you guys, but I'm happy to, that we have, a, yeah, we have some time for other thoughts. So rosins, yeah, there are, there are thick, sticky rosins and lighter, thinner rosins. And yeah, I wonder if each instrument and each bow and each, combination of strings um, affects your rosin choices. You might, you might have ones and also um, location. So like people in hot climates, maybe don't want the stickier rosins um, that might affect things. Um, okay. We have so if questions. anyone has a question, I think at this point you can, she'll read the chats, but also you can unmute yourself, wave your hand or something so you don't speak over each other, but so we can hear your lovely voices. So I have one in chat here. I was wondering about the relationship distance of the hairs on the bow and the, oh, you mean on the hairs and the stick. 
I think is what the question was about. Yeah, okay, so, um, excellent. Okay, so we talked a little bit about over tightening the bow and under tightening the bow. And each bow has its just magic zone, right? Of, of what's gonna work for your bow. Um, sometimes that has to do with like, if I need a rehair, um, the hairs get stretched out and I have to tighten it as far as it will go. And, um, and then if I have an outdoor gig and, and it's humid, I'm toast, right? Because you get to a point where you can't tighten it anymore. And if the hairs are, are loose and you're at the end of your, your stick, then you, you're gonna be playing on the stick. Um, but putting aside any like snafus like that, if things are operating okay, um, you still may be hearing some stick sound when you play, right? You might be getting a little bit of that raspy sound. Um, and that can come from either over pressure um, without elongating your stroke. And it can also be from tilting your bow a little bit too much. So if you're getting some stick sound, the first thing I do is square away the bow, right? So instead of this, I'll be going to like, flatter hair. Now, I tend to like a little bit of a of an angled hair. I feel that it gives me a way to carve a, a, a line out, right? If I'm totally flat, sometimes that's great for like um, sawing away on a Mahler symphony when I just playing Ds in a row and somebody else is doing something interesting, right? If I'm just trying to create a lot of sound and help my cello section, um, it's just kind of, you know, it's, it's tilted uh, flatter. Now, violinists tilt this way, upper strings, violins and violas tilt this way. Cellos and basses will tilt a little bit this way. And then there's always your flat option for, for stuff like that. Um, now, from Buddy, thank you. Thank you, Buddy. Any other questions? Okay, I'm sorry you have to leave. Thank you. Stay in touch. <laughs> All right, so I just have a quick question before we bring this to a close. And if someone types a question in or something, holler, interrupt me. Um, so if anyone is interested, do you offer coachings through Zoom, through whatever, um, and lessons? Sure, absolutely. Um, I, uh, yes, you could certainly contact me, especially random, you know, Random coachings often even work better than trying to be, you know, trying to be a studio student, you know, that either way, like, you know, if it goes really well and you want to keep up and have several lessons, I'm here. I'm totally here. So there is on Facebook. And if you have trouble reaching her there, holler at me and I'll send you her way and make sure. So, um, my email is easy. It's sarah.caps at gmail.com. So yes, I'm totally findable. And if you want coachings on not cello, I can, you know, we can have sort of lessons um, and coachings. And then, you know, if you want to find a good violin teacher, I know Anna can certainly recommend people, but also if you just want, you know, want, different guidance in, in some way we can do that well yeah. i just want to say you know gary carr is one of is one of the most famous bass players in history and my favorite and he talks about how we can all get they, they, one of the best teachers he ever had was a soprano and how we can gain so much from taking lessons from people that aren't actually on our instrument so i love to encourage people to do that so our coachings you know mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All right, well, I just want to say, first of all, thank you guys so much. You, I had, you know, it's Thursday. I know a lot of us are tired. I'm tired. I had a, no sleep last night. And you guys, Sarah has invigorated me. I actually want to practice and I don't have a cello at home. So <laughs> I'll have to wait till tomorrow. But um, but um, I, I mean, and seeing you guys smile and ask your questions and everything's made my whole day. So I hope you've really, really loved it. Um, next week is super cool. And um Raymond Leong, he's a violinist with the Atlanta Symphony. He's got like 
an unbelievable bow collection. And he's gonna talk about how to try out bows, how different bows feel, how you can hear the differences of them. We may even get him to share his Sartori collection. He has a Sartori from every decade that Sartori made bows. It's pretty amazing. So <laughs> it's really cool. And um, so, but what's really neat is you may not realize it, but he can play three different bows and you'll hear like three completely different instruments. And, um, and for him to talk about that, and he's really, really an expert. So I hope to see you all next Thursday. If you need any of the details, they're on the Huthmaker Violence Facebook page. There's an event for each of these. So, so and, um, but when we do hang up and leave, Natasha, would you please hang out for a second? Mm -hmm. I need to talk to you, so. Thank you so much for these messages. You guys are warming my heart. I hope you stay safe and, you know, all that and take care thank you so much really fun thank you thank yeah you. in trinidad and maryland and alabama that's very cool and portland somebody came from portland i think really yeah, <laughs> yeah. thank you so much for awesome. joining you oh yeah thanks for hosting awesome really yeah. so thank all you. right all right I'll see you. <laughs> bye friends bye, bye. Anna, did you need me to hang out too? No, you're good, sweetie. Um, okay. <laughs> I had a text from my mom halfway through that it just had one word and it said magical. You're fat. Oh. Oh. Like, so are you a dark chocolate or a milk chocolate person? Well, technically I don't eat chocolate at all anymore. Technically I'm a gin person. <laughs> but when all right. <laughs> cello sound, I'm an all chocolate girl. So. Okay. <laughs> Very good. I'll keep that in mind for future reference. For future reference. All right. <laughs> Bye, Anna. Okay. <laughs> good night. Good night. And Linda, I want to talk to you later too. So, mm -hmm. all right. Hold on a second. I'm going to stop our recording. Um,